Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm James Milan. I am with uh, Jennifer Fries, who is a candidate for the 24th Middlesex District State Representative. Um, and we are here for a one on one conversation in which we are just going to get to know Jennifer, the person, and Jennifer, the candidate, a little bit better. Um, first of all, Jen, thanks so much for carving the time out. I know this is a busy time leading up to the election for you, obviously. There's always time to talk to the voters. That's what it's all about. <laughs> so all right. So let's let's do that. Let's let's make sure that the voters uh, know more about you uh, than they, you know, at the end of this conversation than they do at the start. Um, and let me ask uh, to for that. Um, why don't you just before we start delving into your professional background and how that you know has a lot to do with your running for office. <clears throat> I'm curious about why you would take this kind of thing on. This is a, one of my colleagues called this a brave thing uh, for you to do. And I don't think that she was, uh, I don't think she was off with that. Um, I do think it's brave to take on the challenge of running, especially in the current circumstances uh, for public office. So what motivated you to do so? Is it something that's been on your mind a while or something recent? What, what is that? So, I am a lifelong Democrat and I, I was a public policy major and both undergraduate and I have my master's in public administration. So in some ways it's not that crazy that I would run for office. I'm the kind of person that people tend to ask, who are you voting for and that kind of thing because they know I'm, I'm paying attention. But on the other hand, I also just, I always saw myself as being the supporter to campaigns. and. I would have been a volunteer. I've done lots of things on lots of different campaigns for um, candidates for office and also just for issue campaigns that I cared a lot about. And um, so, yeah, this is very different for me and out of the comfort zone. And I think like a lot of people after the 2016 election, I felt like whatever I was doing, I needed to do more. And um, when I looked around, I felt like there was a lot that was um, broken on the state level that our state politics just had so much um, in the way of just delaying, dragging their feet on really important policy, obstructing it. I felt like it was really hard for the average person to know what's happening on things, policies that they really care about and just day-to-day -day services that really mean a lot. Like, schools being funded adequately, the T running well. Um, I also have been hearing people talk, worry about their future because of climate change and the future of their children and grandchildren. Um, and housing, all the things that um, I know a lot about from my career in the nonprofit world. And so I had a group of people over my house to do postcarding for Stacey Abrams. And it was the weekend that we knew, it was the Friday night that we knew that Brett Kavanaugh was gonna be appointed to the Supreme Court. And um, it was a really raw conversation because that news was just really hard to take. And it, we also had just been hearing more and more about families being separated at the borders. And um, it, people were talking about just how we needed more people in office that knew about on the direct level how these policies were impacting people and i was also sharing with some people just my frustration i had visited my rep about an issue i really cared about the red flag law and he said he was with us but he spent the whole time playing devil's advocate he literally said he wanted to play devil's advocate and he did and um i just left really disheartened and somehow out of that i was you know a lot of people were there from the neighborhood um, they encouraged me to, to run for the seat. And the next day I actually applied to a candidate training program uh, that encourages Democratic women to run for office. And even then I, it was very um, preliminary because I ran a nonprofit that had a state contract and um, is pretty important in the Cambridge community. And I didn't want to have it be seen that my nonprofit was tied up in politics. So I told my board of directors I was entering this program and at the end of six months, I would let them know if I was gonna run for office. And uh, I came out of it still feeling like I could make a difference. And I did, I left that job. I took another job that's more compatible um, with campaigning. And um, 
Yeah, I sometimes say that running for office is my midlife crisis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 50 and, uh, and um, yeah, I'm the same age as, uh, or just um, the train that derailed on the red line is just a little bit older than me. And it was supposed to be 25 years in service. So, um, yeah. Anyway. All right. So no wonder you're, you're the MBTA is one of your one of the, you know, yeah. obviously your key issues and concerns, which we will talk about a little bit more um, yeah. further on in the conversation. But you did reference uh, your career in nonprofits. So tell us about that. And especially with an emphasis on, you know, voters understanding how it is that that career would be relevant to and perhaps uh, an excellent preparation for uh, uh, you know, the, the job of state rep. Yeah. So I started my career as a volunteer. I was a volunteer on a suicide hotline in college. And that led to volunteering also on the domestic violence um, shelter hotline at the shelter and on the hotline and in the family courts in um, Providence, Rhode Island. I ultimately wrote my thesis, my honors thesis on prosecution of domestic violence misdemeanors in the case when a witness, the victim is hesitant to go forward. And it really makes a difference in terms of policy, how the prosecutor approaches that hesitant witness, it turns out. And so I did original research on that and presented my findings to the Attorney General in Rhode Island. Um, and uh, so then I worked for many years in domestic violence shelters and programs and made a slight shift when I took a job at uh, in a statewide capacity at the Massachusetts Legal Assistance Corporation. That is a quasi state agency. So it was funded by statute and you know, there's certain things in the statute that says who can be on the board and how it runs. Um, but it is an independent nonprofit. So it's a little one of those strange. So beasts. that's what quasi means in that case yes. is that it's kind of gets some of its funding from Yeah. Yes. State, but okay. Yeah, not just funding, but some of its authority to operate. Okay. So it's not um, a 501c3, it's, it's a little different. Um, and so I was second in command there. And while I was there, I was able to um, be part of a founding coalition that uh, the Equal Justice Coalition that started something called Walk to the Hill for Legal Aid. We were able to secure, break a logjam and secure millions of dollars of funding for legal assistance for people who are facing things like eviction, elder law crises, employment issues, housing issues of other kinds, um, immigration cases. And in a separate effort while I was there, I also was able to secure several million dollars of funding annually for victims of domestic violence, um, who um, that's actually the most effective intervention um, in terms of uh, reducing homicides for against victims and their children is legal assistance. It's kind of strange. You would think shelter would be the thing that would be the most effective, but there's good research that shows that um, providing legal assistance because it allows the victim to maintain her independence mm -hmm. and potentially get income and support that otherwise she wouldn't get, um, he or she, um, that it, it actually legal assistance is the thing that makes it less likely that a victim will be killed and their children. Um, so anyway, I, I, we, I was successful in that. It was um, hard work. We had a very conservative speaker who was opposed to funding those kinds of things. And it took uh, assembling an unusual coalition of people to um, change his mind, at least to let it go forward. It wasn't that he was a fan of legal services, but it, just like now, it's very hard to get a vote on important legislation. You can't even get it to the floor. Um, and that's one of the things that I've seen over the years has just been broken on, on Beacon Hill is that really good legislation goes into committee and on a secret vote, it dies. So we never see an unpublished vote. We never see why things don't come out. Um, and then sometimes things are just stuck, stuck there, like the Roe Act, which um, is um, a, about reproductive health care and abortion rights that it has been stuck in committee for more than 18 months. And, um, you know, that's that's kind of typical of a lot of really good and important laws. Um, there, is yeah. there, I mean, what do you, excuse the interruption, but what do you, um, what do you attribute that phenomenon that you're you know describing too um why is it that that happens uh with more regularity than you or maybe all of us would like 
it to? I think that there is um, a consolidation of power in leadership, which can happen in any institution. Um, however, what I th I'm afraid I see happening is that people who can afford to hire lobbyists know exactly what's going on on Beacon Hill. And people who can't, which is everyone else, you and me and everybody else, all the voters, we, we can't even figure it out. Like it's very opaque and it's opaque by design. Um, and so as a result, you have things like uh, corporate tax cuts and loopholes created and um, just it works, the system works pretty well for people who are wealthy enough or corporations usually or people who are wealthy enough to hire lobbyists. Um, but it does not work well for the rest of us. And I, I, I think that that is by design to a certain extent. It's who they want to hear from. And I think that we need to open it up. It could use some sunshine as a cleanser and um, we could use some transparency in the house rules. I've taken a transparency pledge from Act on Mass. I'm part, I'm, it's not something that just I'm um, passionate about. There's a whole movement around transparency right now and trying to increase transparency because people are realizing much like campaign finance reform, transparency is a block, it's something that would correct a whole lot of things that are wrong with the system and help us produce better governance, good governance um, for people and centered around the people. So you, uh, and again, I'm mindful of the fact that I interrupted your, your uh, describing your, you know, the buildup um, professionally to, to hear, and we can certainly get back to that. But just to follow up on this a little bit more, um, what you describe in terms of the problems or the, the systemic issue with uh, in, in perhaps the in the state house here, sounds like that's the problem with the way that government functions on all levels, which is that those who have access or uh, tend to be those who are best financed and best, uh, you know, just have the deepest pockets and they know how to get things done, as you said, and they have the ears or they can get their phone calls uh, answered, etc. Um, and that just, again, seems like that's the way that things work in general. Do you think that the situation in Massachusetts and in the State House is uh, is is as as bad as it is, for instance, in people's perception on the federal level, um, and that we, you know, that it's broken in many of those same ways? That's a good question. Um... I think that one thing that people don't realize because we think of Massachusetts as being a very blue state is that the, the House in particular, the Senate actually has better rules and better transparency um, than the House. And um, Massachusetts actually has um, a very secretive culture compared with other state houses in, uh, on the, in the House level. And, um, so it is unusual that way, and it, it can be hard for, for instance, committee votes are secret. So there is something that you hear about all the time from um, lobbyists. So the lobbyists I know are people who lobby for things like homelessness, <laughs> and maybe there's like one person in the whole state who does that work, or a legal aid person who's lobbying on behalf of the needs of um, people who can't get unemployment or something like that. Um, but, you know, so those people are, they are, they are registered lobbyists. Um, so um, what I hear from people like that who um, really know about the system is that um, uh, reps will tell you to your face if you're a constituent that they support a bill and sometimes they'll even sponsor it and then they vote against it in committee. Hmm. Um, and, you know, that's really frustrating. And we should be able to have honest, open debates about what we support and I guess I'm at a place in my life where I feel like I can be very transparent, just personally too, about what I support and why. It may not be the most popular thing, everything I support, but I can ground it in my lived experience of uh, several decades of personal and professional experience living in the district and helping um, secure funding and you know, provide programs and work with people to improve their lives. And so, you know, there are things that may be controversial, like the Safe Communities Act. Um, 
which um, if people don't know, the Safe Communities Act, another thing that's been stuck in committee, is something that um, sets limits and boundaries around how our state authorities work with immigration, the federal authorities. And the, the way I've explained it to voters is I've worked with many victims of domestic violence whose abusers used their status against them. And in many cases, they were eligible to become American citizens, but their American citizen husband who was abusive to them refused to file the papers because that was something he could hold over her. Um, and so he would say to her, I'm gonna get you deported and I'm gonna keep the kids because the kids are American citizens. He doesn't want the kids meanwhile, but he wants to pressure her to do whatever it is he wants her to do. And so, um, you know, this is not just one victim I'm talking about. I've talked with many victims and survivors that this is one of the pieces of it. You know, he marries her while he's, uh, you know, on military duty abroad, brings her home, doesn't file the paperwork. So, and then he threatens her that if you call the police, I'm going to get you deported. And at least during the prior administration, they had policy um, guidelines that said, no, don't deport that person. But our current administration is actually doing the complete opposite. Anyone that they can, they are deporting. It doesn't matter if they're a victim of domestic violence, a child, a, uh, an infant, um, a victim of trafficking, they're deporting them. And so when we're in this environment where our federal government is putting children in cages, um, we really need to stand up and pass the Safe Communities Act. And I can explain why because I have had that day-to-day -day experience with people um, in the district. So. You know, I, I don't, un, personally, I can't imagine how many people would argue with the goal of increasing transparency, for instance, mm -hmm. um, as, uh, you know, as a mission that one would enter state office with. But I am curious about what, um, what is your hope were you to be elected and join um, the, 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 the House, what is your hope for making change in that area? Is it that you hope to be part of a larger movement of people, you know, the others who have subscribed as you have uh, uh, taken that transparency pledge that you, because I would think you need, like there are limits to what you could do as one representative. Absolutely. So what is, you know, let's just, let's just assume for the purposes of the conversation or this part of it, you get in, um, you're voted in. What can you do um, to address these issues, uh, again, around transparency and just the way that the, this particular state house functions? So I, I am part of a movement of candidates and um, some already elected officials who have taken this transparency pledge. And um, so the, if there are enough of us, we could actually amend the rules and just make it better permanently. Um, but if there aren't, we've pledged that we will publish our votes. If um, we'll publish our votes in committee, we will, um, if we're chair of a committee, publish all the votes from that committee. Um, so, and I, if I can tell you a little bit more about the unusual coalition we built for Walk to the Hill, um, one of the things that we did, we realized that the speaker at the time, Tom Finneran, for those who remember when he used to be our speaker, um, now a felon, ex felon, um, he um, was really determined not to provide any additional funding for legal aid. And um, the funding had just eroded year by year because of inflation. And it was really at a crisis point of layoffs and that kind of thing. And the coalition that we assembled in the end, we realized he didn't care if you brought low income people up to talk to reps. Literally that just did not budge anything. And so we realized that there was this whole group that was um, potentially influential and sympathetic. And it was people who went to law school with these legal aid attorneys, really cared about, and maybe did a little pro bono law, really cared about access to justice, but worked at big firms and worked at big companies. So we assembled a group of about 35 corporate counsels from major corporations based in Massachusetts, and they, we had them do a press conference, and that totally got the speaker's attention because it was big name companies. 
And then we also got attorneys from all these firms and it's an annual event now. It really is influential because it's something that an attorney can do. Um, if you're billing out by the hour, your, your time is just really tight. And so it, you know, if you, but if you work on a firm at a firm in Boston, downtown Boston, which a lot of people do, it's just a, a couple hours out of your day once a year and you walk to the hill and you see your rep and you tell them why access to justice is important to you um, as a, you know, attorney at Foley Hoag or something, you know, and all of a sudden they're like, oh. Um, and so it really has made a huge difference in having those people listen to. And yes, then we do also bring low income people who can really speak to it, but they're speaking, you know, when we have all those attorneys assembled and, um, you know, then the legislators want to come and then the person can speak to the real situation in their lives. So, um, so yeah, I think sometimes you have to be a little strategic and I'm ready to do that. And I, um, you know, I've built long-term partnerships, public-private partnerships of all different kinds. The other thing I, I've done in my career is I've done a lot of work in the nonprofit sector in education. And in that role, as I, I would ha led the largest nonprofit partner with the Cambridge Public Schools. And it's a agency that's about a half million dollar budget and runs programming before, during, and after school in the Cambridge Public Schools. And we had a number of partnerships with tech, biotech, pharma companies, engineering firms. And these were long-term partnerships that we started. You know, I started a partnership with Novartis that I think, again, has been about 20 years now since they came to Cambridge. Um, and they mentor students in seventh grade in the public schools. And it's hard to sustain partnerships. It takes work and it takes trust and effort. And I'm willing to put that time and effort in. You know, there are many times when those programs could have failed. You know, the Cambridge Public School is totally restructured. And in any normal environment, like the, the volunteer projects would have just come to a close because that school closed and the teachers were different. And we facilitated to make sure that those relationships continued because it was about making connecting the students, the children with mentors. And it was really important that it keep going. So. Mm -hmm. You know, we have um, only, it's, it's time is flying, it always does. Uh, we have only about seven, eight minutes uh, to go. I wanted to give you an opportunity. Uh, you, did, you did have a chance in a recent debate uh, that you, you were involved in to really elaborate pretty well on, on the, your, pro, your particular priorities, but go ahead and pick one or two uh, uh, of the things that you, you know, are most important to you about why you're running and what you want to do. Mm -hmm and tell us some more. So my three priorities are fixing the T, addressing climate change, and reinvesting in our UMass system and our public schools. And I guess I am a public school parent and I, I'd like to speak a little bit about schools and school funding. So um, when we talk about local aid, the funding that flows into cities and towns from the state, one of the biggest buckets is chapter 70 money which is for education public education in our cities and towns and um the legislature after dragging its feet and dragging its feet there was this thing called the foundation budget review committee it said that we were underfunding education by one to two billion dollars back in 2015 um and then nothing happened nothing happened finally they passed an act to address this called the student opportunity act and it was supposed to then over seven years, each year one seventh of the funding to get us over seven years to the full funding that would be needed to um, make up for um, things like really rising healthcare costs, special education costs, the cost of educating low income students who might need additional services or English language learners, uh, and some special stuff for rural districts. So, all, all things I might say that we have been wrestling with here in Arlington. For yeah, of course. A while, so. Yeah. Um, sorry um, so um, finally, finally, they passed it. And now they're saying because of COVID and revenues that they're not going to fund it. So it was considered it, local aid will be level funded, which is good, plus a little inflation, but they're not going to fund the Student Opportunity Act. And here's what I would like to say about spending right now. It may seem counterintuitive and you may feel like, well, the state should not spend when we're in a recession. But what I will say to you is recessions get worse if you cut spending. If you do austerity measures, 
it actually counterintuitively makes your recession longer and worse. And if the state steps up and provides money for essential services um, of all kinds, and I'll just use this as one example, you get out of your recession more quickly. And I mean, we hope it's not a full recession, but it could be if we don't make the right choices. And I think funding the Student Opportunity Act is one of the right choices we should be making. And I would prioritize that in my work at the State House. Well, you know, it does seem from our talk with, uh, our chats with, you know, our, our Sean Garbley, Dave Rogers as state representative, Cindy Friedman as a senator, that they are really under, you know, under a lot of pressure to find money when the money is, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so where would, where, if, if we're going to take that step that you're saying to fund things, you know, as much or more in, in order to, you know, how the effect that that will have, where will that money come from? Where so, would you get it? Where would you get it from? So we've had a number of tax cuts over the years since 1998. We've had about $3 billion in tax cuts. And um, we could decide that we are going to raise certain taxes in order to raise revenues. Um, they did do a slight adjustment to the corporate taxes, but there could be more. I often talk about the corporate tax is, as something that should be funding transit because companies are really worried about how their people are going to get to work. And I think they're realizing as much as we fought for and asked for these tax cuts, is it really working out for us if our employees can't make it into work um, reliably on the T and they can't on the roads either because as soon as we go back to work, we'll be back in that worst in the nation traffic that we had last fall and, and into the winter. So I think that we can expect our corporations to do more. We can expect our wealthy citizens to do more. And again, they are benefiting from a good economy. If we, um, it's not to stick it to somebody. It's, listen, we all can do better if you would chip in a little more so that we can all have a better quality of life and your employees can too. And I think that that's important. And I think we can make that case and uh, make that choice. Mm -hmm. So we've got only a minute or two. Um, what else would you like to make sure the voters know? I just want to make sure that people know that this year voting by mail is safe and secure in Massachusetts. You have the right to vote by mail and you, um, you may have already returned your postcard. It looks like this um, that came. You still have time to return that if you want to request a ballot. There's also an online, if you go to jenniferfreeze.com, which is my website, Freeze is spelled like French fries, F-R-I-E-S. Um, you can click on a link there to go to the Secretary of the Commonwealth's vote um, by mail information. Uh, if you also, for the first time, will be able to track your ballot. So if you do not get your ballot in time, or if you submit your ballot, if you mail it back and it is not received in time and counted, you have the right to vote in person. So a lot of people who vote in primaries are like me. I vote in every election and it actually gives me pain to think of not being able to vote for some reason or having my vote not be counted. So I just wanna reassure people that your vote will be counted and you also have the right to go and vote in person if your vote is not counted for, uh, in time. Um, you know, if you're getting your ballot and you realize it's too late, um, to mail it back, you can go and vote in person and that is mm -hmm. your right. You can also return your ballot to the drop box at town hall. Um, so if you're worried about putting it in the mail, you can go and do that. And, and protocols I, will be in place to do that safely, I know. Yes. Um, and I will um, just say I ask for your vote in the Democratic primary. I believe that I can make a difference for all of us and I am just honored for the opportunity to speak to all the voters and um, thank you for having me today, James, and um, thank you to the voters for tuning in and for doing the work of democracy. Well, I agree on all counts. I wanna thank you for joining us today, Jennifer Fries, and you, the viewers, uh, for tuning in. Uh, hopefully you got um, some valuable information, I'm sure you did. Um, thank you to everybody for joining us for this one-on-one -on -one conversation with candidate for 24th Middlesex District State Representative Jennifer Fries from Cambridge. Um, thanks again, Jen. Thank, thank you. you. I'm James Milan. Take care.